if you rub your hands together for seven seconds, that the amount of friction, it it can the friction can clean your hands as well as antibacterial soap. Was it a myth or was it a fact? No, they, it was true. Oh, good. Yeah. So I don't ever use soap anymore. I just I just pee all over my hands and then does, I just does that do get rid of the, all the <laughs> fecal matter too. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Garage Strength Podcast, where we're going to help you become the masters of sport. Yeah, all that cool stuff. We're talking about squatting today. That's like about- We're ripping right into squatting. Yeah, so imagine stepping into a gym, and you're going to use one exercise and one exercise only. Oh, geez. So it's like uh, we're on a deserted island, yeah. but we're in a gym. To train in excess of, what, like 250 muscles somewhere about there, yeah. like or at least engaged. Yeah, something like that. Um, Now just picture the elegance of that body movement, right? <laughs> Envision the act of bending the knees, lowering the hips, and the ankles allowing the knees to track over the toes. Now some of you, I think, are going to naughty places, but <laughs> stick with me for a bit. <laughs> Feel the tension in the trunk, spine, back, and ribs. Feel the heart rate increase as the kilos press down on the traps and gravity refuses to let up. But I only use pounds. No, get out of here. <laughs> Grow up. See the feet grabbing the floor with the toes and push it into the ground to resist, elevating the weight through the concentric stage with the quads, the hamstrings, even the calves a little bit, the glutes, and every other muscle not mentioned. And people and persons, you have just envisioned yourself squatting. That's that was a. At first, I thought I, <clears throat> I thought I was going to the bathroom in Japan. Oh, uh, well, do you have to squat then? Uh, yeah. How about that? Yeah, we're like you squat in the in their airports. They have like the squatty holes. It sounds so much more like just like a nudge. It's way- <laughs> towards like living longer in life because oh, yeah. you're forced to squat deep. and have mobility. Yeah, even when you're older. I don't know. My toilet doesn't go down that far. I have a squatty potty. Oh, do you? Yeah, so it elevates my feet. Really? Yeah. So then you end up like you're in a deeper squat. Yeah. So your cheeks spread more to poop more. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's much. It. It's healthier supposedly. To squat, yes, yeah. it's way healthier than yeah. only going to ninety degrees. Imagine going to like sit on a normal toilet and you blow out like your patellas because you're squatting to ninety degrees <laughs> or squatting. You get all. The way all down. Maybe that's where all of our knee pain actually comes from. Is that we're only <laughs> doing power lifter squats? Yeah. <laughs> that's Your whole what, life. We should come out with a new version of Squatty Potty. That's it's called the Ass to Grass. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's a great that's a great marketing scheme. We're selling you the Ass to Grass. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I just had like how could you like how do I say it like a uh, circle that into like how the like wiping then too like oh so easy so you'll low use, the grass will get it off yeah, for you <laughs> you'll lose you'll you'll use less less toilet paper <laughs> all the fun all right peak strength right too everyone should get that yeah guy. yeah so I mean talking about squatting too this episode is sponsored by Garage Strength Equipment where we sell the world's premier single leg roller and pad. Uh, and you can head over to peakstrength.app if you want to pick up our brand new app that is no longer brand new, but for some reason I just said it was brand new. If you go to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store, you can pick that up and you will learn how to do a whole bunch of different variations around back squatting, front squatting, single leg squatting to help you become a better athlete. Yeah, methods of squatting, right? So when we think about squatting, at least from like a sports performance coaching perspective, like you think about technique. Um, the movement patterns around squatting, like physiology, limb length, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Neural intelligence, how you develop all that. I got a litany of stuff. The weight used or the intensity that's on the bar. Then at the same time, how you load the bar, right? Like front, back, zercher or something like that. Dumbbells, yeah, trap Um, bar even. Variations of the squat then too, which you started getting into real quick with just like front, back, single leg squats. Yeah. frequency so volume and intensity what days you train it like i don't know lower power lower body power day and an impulse day say yeah, at least. um and then just global programming like over a 20 week period over in season out season and stuff like that um we're gonna try to get into most of that 
I don't know if we'll get into all of it with the same level. It, it's interesting because as you were describing that in the, in the beginning when I was thinking through, like working through those positions, I've been on this kick lately of, and Jason can attest to this, where I've just been begging him to get me combine videos of the 40 L cone and the shuttle. And as you were describing it, I was visualizing like the the joint angles coming out of the start, coming out you know, like the first five strides, and then in the shuttle or the the L cone drill, what happens when they're cutting and when they're leading to these different positions, these sort of like weird positions, but pretty similar positions that you might see from a wide receiver running a route. Or I was even thinking about it with the shuttle then. I started to think, go into like your description got me into the world of tennis and how the shuttle – test is very similar to what you see with yeah the tennis it's like player. the general game of tennis like the movements you do right and it's like seeing something you know a max strength movement like the back squat or a single leg squat or whatever being applied at that high speed you can start to see where like the stability can be created and the strength can be improved and why it is so versatile and so important for long-term development yeah and then if your body's able to stand up I want to say it like your body weight naturally, right? Mm -hmm. But then this excess, this load and excess of is put on it too, and you're in these weirder positions. All of a sudden, it makes it that much easier to be faster out of it, more powerful out yeah, of it, yeah, more athletic, yeah, you know, yeah, all that cool stuff. All right, let's talk about let's get into when the squad is primarily programmed within like garage strength program design, the parabolic periodization, and that tends to happen on like power day yep. and impulse day. Yes. Talk to us about that. Like so developing leg power and developing impulse. I, I think if you look at it, like we got five days of training and then you can go, all right, five days of training. And, you know, we use the example of a tennis player, football player, or, you know, we could even argue, a, like, let's say a swimmer and you go, okay, day one would be leg power day. So on what, leg power day, I'm going to, I'm going to back squat or do some type of squat. Uh, earlier in the in the phases, so if we go exposure phase, comprehension phase, ascension phase, summit phase, realization, earlier, so in exposure and comprehension, you might just do a back squat or, or a pause back squat. And then as you go through, you might get that squat to be a little bit more specific to the sport. So you might do for a swimmer a squat to a box and pause. You might do for a football player as they get closer to their to their season single leg squats. Um, and, and you can just vary that. You can figure out what type of squat transfers best to the specific sport. And then as you work through those phases, you, you choose that variation. But I think looking, going back to that beginning in a week, it's just going to be, dude, just put it here, leg power day. Then you can put it here, another version on impulse day. And then you can tra change the loading based off of what type of goal you need to see out of that, out of that athlete. I'm curious since you were naming sports and like, sort of like, Here's the best squat for that sport. Mm -hmm. What's the best squat for like a wrestler, or combat sport athlete? Uh, I like single leg front squats. Do you? Yeah. Why the front squat? Why the front rack versus the back rack in that position? I, I like the back too, but I think very, very specifically, um, being in that front loaded position, I would probably recommend actually going cross armed if you're doing this but you can feel it pulling you forward. So you've got to be more upright in your mid back. And typically like your, you know, especially like the strength of your spinalis or your, your spinal erectors, um, that strength will have a very good impact on your strength on the mat or the strength in, in the cage, wherever you are. And the stronger that is typically, the more capable you will be of taking a, a hit. Okay. Because it does contribute and tie in with how strong and stable your traps and your neck are. Um, and so I think that if you look at, it's going to target the mid-back. It's going to target your abs as well quite a bit. And then just being in that unilateral position because fighters are, relative strength is, is going to play a huge role here. And there's so much agility, especially with wrestling too now uh, and freestyle wrestling tremendously so is like, all the other squats will have a big impact, but if I was trying to peak at a team, yeah, this is around like summit realization. Yeah, type I'm gonna place. I'm gonna try and back off with some of the intensity and do like unbroken okay. single leg front so squats on an impulse day. Too. Yeah, yeah, all those little variations. I I really like that concept around how to create variation 
within the same movement. Yeah. So like you're talking about a single leg squat here, right? And yep. if you think about a single leg squat, just off of what you talked about in that little spiel there was, all right, we'll just take the bar from the back and move it to the front. Mm -hmm. We just created another variation within a variation. Yeah. And then you mentioned as, you know, we want to do it unbroken, created another variation within the variation. You could do unbroken with it on your back, on your front. And it, it was just neat to hear that, like how you can do these just minor little tweaks, like a fractal. Yeah, yeah. And, and you get this whole new kind of response really yeah yeah which is awesome yeah so variations check we'll do that one. <laughs> yeah that's okay. even though it will come up again at some point and i would say the the programming part yeah to a point so speak to that then like go into more detail about that with the programming part are you talking about from like so we have the leg power day and the impulse day right in the yeah. five days of training um the leg power day is usually like associated around more the absolute strength, yep. the intensity of the movement, and mm -hmm. the impulse day is usually associated around athleticism, dynamic, being elastic, and yeah. things like that. Um, so let's talk about that from the programming standpoint with the squat. So I th I think you know using the it, it, okay using the example of the wrestler or the combat athlete. If I can determine early on and say let's say this I I see I've got a fighter. Um, I'm thinking about someone like Alistair over him, just this big, huge, hulking dude, right? These absolute monsters from back in the day. They could probably squat decently. Like, you know, they're a little bit taller, but it's like Brock Lesnar when he was fighting. Like, their back squat was very good. I would look at it and say, all right, where's the low-hanging fruit? How mobile are they in their hips? How, how well do they function when they're on one leg? Because there's going to be points where someone does take a shot, someone does get their leg. How how much control do they have? But doing that will then set me up and say, "All right, for this specific fighter, in our case, using that as an example, or this specific you know wrestler or this specific soccer player, the best squat movement would be um, you know single leg squats, or the best squat movement would be back squats. If we have someone who's really really weak, I would cater it more towards back squats." But then as we would work through those phases, I would look at it like, all right, the impulse day is where we want to use the movement that transfers best for the general population, for like the overarching sport. So how I use the, the single leg front squats for combat, that's what I'm going to use on impulse days. Okay. But the, the strength movement will be variable depending upon the individual. So if we've got Brock Lesnar... He doesn't really need to back squat that much because he's already a monster. We need to work on his dynamic ability. We need to work on, on how he is in on one leg. So then, like this hypothetical, will you single leg squat? You could do both times, yeah. Like, and like just power day and and push the like a day? back squat versus the the front squat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I I think that's very reasonable. So through those that minor variation we were talking about, it now allows you to do that same movement both days it would be the same way as like i'm doing a pause back squat and i'm doing an unbroken back squat yeah, no one would argue yeah. like with exactly exactly the same and i would even say like you might get a basketball player who comes in and you know let's say they do well with step ups or they would they also do very well with single leg squats but let's say they're six seven and they're just they're 200 pounds they're weak like hor horrifically weak we need them to gain weight i would have them front a front squat or back squat to a box on that leg power day Give, get them to a box because they're so tall. Get them to a box, get more range of motion, and get them to just get basic strength, basic, you know, build their back squat to 315, you know, and then over time that 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 would be developed. So it'd be, I, I like to identify with each sport, like what's this best technical coordination for the sport? And then, okay, based off the sport and the athlete, what's what's needed for this person coming in what's that a la carte that we really need to pick from for that person to be better in that sport so i think it's like looking at it through the two lenses is more important yeah so it's like it's more like a meta approach to it right first we start generalize like sport needs this yeah all right you as athlete person and needs sport, this yeah yeah and you go from there and you break it down and i i, th I think that's what makes you know gspd the parabolic periodization so unique is that it's dynamic in that sense and it's easy to do that and not avoid you know progress you know you're actually right right you can make that change and and you can make that read as a coach and 
and it's pretty easy to to plug and play. Yeah, and if you are using GSP and you're paying attention mm-hmm. and you're watching an athlete move, it's even easier to know what's what, needed. What's needed. Yeah, absolutely. It's very. It becomes very clear. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about some technique with the squat? I mean, I think if you're looking at like straight up back squats, I think eighty five probably percent of the time 80 percent of the time you should high bar back squat and you should go full range of motion i think there's there's a place for low bar if you're a power lifter there's a place for low bar if you have someone who's just pathetically weak there's a place for low bar if you've got people who are really tall um there's also places for for box squats you know right now actually haley's doing like i did i've gotten flack be, from my weightlifting not fans weightlifting friends <laughs> Who, like the people you see at Pan Am's type of thing. Yeah, basically, like, like, why is Haley safety bar squatting to a box? And it's like, well, the best deadlifters in the world like this, and I think she needs to improve her pull. So we're doing stuff like that. So I would say technique-wise, I think... And you hate the deadlift, too. Look at that <laughs> yeah, for I your think, athletes. Yeah, you're like, well, I could have a squat. They do this. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, though, it's like being open-minded, but then it still goes back to like high bar back squat, full range of motion, still the best version of a squat. But there's thousands of ways to skin a cat and i think you've got to look at all of those different tools that you can still use and what that tool fixes as far as what problem the athlete would have so it's like you never want to get rid of that stretch reflex in the bottom you never want to get rid of that that tense torso you never want to get rid of applying force through the full foot you never want to get rid of that mobility that you can have and the ability to just grind heavy freaking weight you don't want to get rid of that but you still have to also have to be aware. And I would even say, you know, front squats, the same thing, front squats, zombie squats, they should be all full, full range of motion. And you should be able to go from a full range of motion to a box or go to partial t- potentially um, without real, any, without any real serious issues. And I would even argue with, with like single leg squats, like sometimes we've been playing around lately where we'll, we'll change the height of the pad. So they have less range of motion. We'll, we'll make which pad that where the foot is or where, where the, the knee is where the knee is hitting. Okay. And, and I've been playing around with that what myself. What is the purpose of that? Cause I'm, yeah, me curious. Just, just to stay a little bit taller, um, mimicking like, uh, so uh, again, going back to this combine stuff is in, in the, uh, and I got you the agility stuff that I'm looking at. It's like, there's some times that they're in a deeper single leg position. There's some times that they're in a taller and I would train both. So you're doing it to try to mimic the shin angles yeah. within a mm-hmm. squatted position. Yeah. Yep. And then it's based off what you're seeing in, you know, on field videotape watching, in combine watching. It's like, well, how can I get the body to that range of motion? Right, right. How can I make it just slightly more specific? And it's like, I think there is something to be said for very, very general strength training. I love very general strength training. And ironically, I also love very specific training, like reflexive work. And I also love the middle where it's like, take a single leg squat the single leg squat might be a little bit more to the right of where a back squat would be but then you you add a pad and if you have a sprinter and and if they need to work on how they're grounding at 60 to 100 meters well now you add another pad and that might improve their tension at that that grounding position to me too where my mind went with it when you were talking about raising that pad is now my hips don't go as low yeah so the way i cut running at a certain speed might be exactly that. on like i'm only trying to go like 10 degrees to the yep. left versus like i'm trying to go 90 degrees or something like that my angles need to be different to be as fast as possible yeah so i think that it, this is maybe getting a little off from the squatting but I, I wanted to bring this up was if you if you read research, and I've I've been doing this because I'm trying to write a script for the for hamstrings, which I'll be sending you shortly, Earl. Okay. Um, but if you read the research on hamstring training, if the ham if the hip stays flexed, so if you do a razor curl, you go out, boom, 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 yeah, boom, forward, back, forward, back, and your hip stays flexed when you come back, okay, you come back and your hips like at a ninety degrees. It's not you're not upright like you would be on a Nordic. You're yeah. at ninety degrees. That point there's a massive uh contraction in your hamstring in the proximal area like closer to your butt uh and and so if you have someone who maybe has hamstring issues uh close to their close to their glutes or whatever you would want to train more so in that area to strengthen that issue versus doing the nordics yeah 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 exactly or the razor actually is 
an easier movement. I think it, I think it could be or it, it could be dependent upon the person's problems. Oh wow! Now so now, it's, now I'm getting a little sense of like personal pride here with that. <laughs> Just keep going though. <laughs> so so when I was thinking through all this stuff when I'm reading the, that research and also just thinking about like heavy RDLs for hamstring work, it's like, why do we see, you know, and bodybuilders have known this for a while, a while is like, there's points in the system where you have to train full range of motion and you don't want to do partials. And then there's points where you want to use partials. And then there's points where you want to use both. And then there, you have to peak properly and you have to understand when, when every, when the spices need to be placed yeah, there properly. Everything's a tool. Yeah. So it's like going back to the squat. It's like, well, what if I, what if we're doing this research and we're doing, and we're understanding like a shorter hip drop targets a little bit more of the glutes or a little bit more of the quads at a certain point in the single leg. And now we can take someone who has really weak quads and light their quads up a little bit more, you know, and, and that otherwise wouldn't happen if they were doing full range where the hamstrings and the, and the glutes could almost hide their, their so quad weakness. From a programming standpoint, if you want the full range of motion, right? Like have to have it, you know, you're a, you're a zealot about this. Mm -hmm. How do you convince that zealot? Or what would be a way to be like, all right, we'll let you do that all the time. But how do I get you to do these partial ranges here? Like, where would you put that? Saying accessories. In the accessories? Yeah. Could you do it? My question then, could you convince, like, could I convince you, like, you're the zealot? Could I be like, Dane, why don't you do the full range of motion and then go ahead and do it in a drop set that way? Oh, yeah, for sure on drop sets. I should have answered that first. I should have said that. That would have been. Yeah, but accessories works too. Yeah, but I, I so I, I would say drop sets are a great way to, to. So actually, here's a good example Impulse Day right now for Sam Mattis. Sam Mattis is, if you don't know, he's number, U.S. Olympic. Yeah, in a discus. Rep, representative Olympic discus. Yeah, number four Just in the world. Very large individual very fast incredibly strong yeah like, so he does partial range of motion back squats on his impulse day at 250 kilos to a box that's like 30 inches okay? oh wow pretty high boom boom really fast but then he does two sets down at like 150 full range of motion for three one two three one two three so to me is that the drop set the full yeah range? the drop set oh wow yeah. that's a neat way to like sort of invert it too so, so it's like that to me is a really good way to take the zealot in your case yeah and and use it as like all right i can appease i can appease you and you might also have like for me i have a lot of throwers that are coming to me post collegiately so i might have to do that because they've been in another system and they need one or two or three years to transition out of that old system into mine and i, I might have to adapt my yeah. system a little bit to what they need meet them there a little bit right that's awesome though that we were talking about one way of doing it and you're like i'm already doing it but the opposite yeah <laughs> uh, but i think either way whatever your goals yeah. are very nice all right um should we talk about a single leg roller again and how everyone should buy it and they yeah. should probably get two foam pads yeah you now, should get right? two foam pads to change the range of motion yeah and i will say this is that i i actually I went the heaviest I've gone on single leg squats on Sunday because I've been running a lot more. And so I've been like, all right, I want to just, can I do 120 for like a double or a triple? Yeah. Dude, I was killed by this. But what's crazy is that even when I went out to run then two days later, I was still a little sore. And I know 120 is not that much. Jake would be laughing because Jake's done like 140 for like a set of five on each leg. Yeah, but Jake was also like at a peak training. Like <laughs> yeah, it's like total freak level. Um, and I'd like to see, I would like to see Jake do it after running seven to 12 miles. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, a, I will say Jake as a weightlifter does not understand what that does to your legs. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be, that's accurate. Um, but the, going back to picking up a single leg roller, the thing that I found so unique and i wanted to tell you about this one deadlift variation i came up with is i have so much confidence when i put my leg on the actual roller and because of the foam density that we use like i've used other foam pads that are like a little bit more squishy uh -huh. where with this like how stable our foam pad is i'm like dude at least i know i'm confident this roller is not going to give out and i know the pad can handle my knee so if i die i'm going to die because 
of me, not because of the equipment. So, yeah, go to Garage Strength and pick up a single leg roller. Very nice. Yeah. 120 for a double. It's not bad. It's okay. I mean, it's not terrible. I did do like 90 for like a set of seven. It may be set. like a four, almost 40 year old, like. Yeah, yeah, almost 40 PR. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I should like, try and single leg squat like 300 pounds or something for a double. I have never been a strong single leg squatter. Also, too, it was only like thrown in there ever in programming. Yeah, like, like once in a while. Yeah, it wasn't like something you could actually like well, get I've into. Well, I've been, because of the hamstring research too, I've been trying to get in, like I've been hammering razors and Nordics. And uh -huh. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty solid with those. I have, I th believe i have done a nordic on a glute ham where i had my knees over the pad already okay so like your your shins are on it yeah and it was like the worst experience Horrible. of my life and mm -hmm. i went to i think i went to do it the next week and like i couldn't hit one where i was like tr banging out like four the prior week yeah. yeah um but razors though like never struggled with it so that's, that's why it, like i could boop 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 and it, and it was all right. Yeah, like I, I wasn't like, oh, this is hard. I was just like. So that's like a good example is like the way that the hamstring's firing is the semitendinosus is a little bit more active than the biceps femoris during a razor curl. And it's like, okay, look at that example. And if I have somebody who's squatting, let's say I have a squatter um, and they can squ back squat a ton, but they can't front squat well. Well, they probably back squat with a ton of their posterior chain and we need to get them to increase yeah. their front squat more. Use the quad. I can never squat yeah. well, but. <laughs> yeah in general <laughs> period I, I had a double body weight you know? <laughs> yeah. like, i didn't really even start squatting until i was like in my 30s too, so <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna complain um let's talk about uh intensity and volume a little bit before we get into our uh overrated underrated oh nice yes i can't wait we're not there yet though but i i think it depends on the goal, but one of the things that I do love or, or the unbroken stuff, I would not go above like three to four reps on single leg if we're doing unbroken. Now, for back squats, I think you can do three to five. The throwers right now on those unbrokens uh, have even told me like 60% unbroken sets for five is still horrible. Uh, so that's like something to just keep in mind. I don't believe them. Well, they're babies. Yeah. And also after going from like a 250 quarter squat to yeah. to that. And it's only on 45 seconds rest. But now looking at back squat, let's say back squat. I love just saying like we're in the exposure phase. Like I want to go three sets of five or three sets of six. And then like a set of nine, and a set of 11. And like I've had Haley do this even during for weightlifting. And it's now for front squats. I don't really like to go much more above five reps. Sometimes You're seven. You're a liar. I was going to say you've done Sometimes seven. Sometimes seven. Yeah. Often. Yeah. I will do seven. And, and I think like it's the same thing if we're squatting to a box, not much more than five reps for, for a box squat unless we're doing a crazy drop set. Um, you know, I, I've even done things too where we'll do – five sets of five traditional back squats. And then we might do like two sets of 30 goblet squats right after it to just get a huge pump rolling. Yeah. And that can actually help with your recovery. But I think typically I will like to push the strength level, the intensity more so than anything when we're talking about big, big squats. Okay. Why is that? Why, why intensity more than volume in that regard? What's like the, just the programming mindset? What's the thought about how it impacts the next day and the day after and the week after? I think mainly because the biggest thing I want to see is the strength adaptation. And I, and I can get the volume from more like exercises that won't be as fatiguing long term, like a goblet squat or, okay. you know, something even like a walking lunge. They won't, they won't, they won't cause as much systemic fatigue as a, a a high volume back squat can yeah, walking lunges into like spanish squats yeah. for like 18 and then like yeah. 30 it uh, sounds like your program yeah it was wonderful it was, <laughs> it was wonderful my my quads were crying literally like, <laughs> yeah. here's the teardrop just yeah. like give it well, to right me. here on your quad yeah that, that's what it was for i know that's what i asked for <laughs> i think the one that was worse the one that was worse um i i feel like it was 15 rep zombie squats. Oh, shit. But it, it was like you were using like, it was like a CrossFit type of workout, like the weight you would use, like yeah. something like 30% or something like that. Um, And you had me do leg extensions into pistol squats. Or oh, the, that'd be horrible. It was. It was real bad. Because you'd come off the leg extension and you'd go to do a pistol squat and it's you like, like you're it's, fall yeah, it's just all. 
Dude, and I'm, I don't cheat like you doing it on boxes so I can like hang my I leg off. I can't hold my hip. Dude, I, there's something with my abs and my hips yeah, that like hurts. You better lo- learn how to co-contract those muscles. Uh, that's fact. <laughs> yeah, man. That's good. <laughs> that's why you don't have a six pack ab. Actually, you're getting there, aren't you? I'm slowly getting there. Yeah. yeah. Good work, Dane. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'm getting that athletic fitness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The dad bod. Yeah. yeah. The corporate dad bod. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the corporate soccer the soccer yeah. sideline dad. Yeah, there you go. You got your like uh quarter zip. Yeah. <laughs> like, your I mocha my... latte or something. <laughs> Yo, like yeah. I do like lattes, sadly. Yeah. Um I want to talk about volume from a concept we talk about with durational strength characteristics. Um, and I, you kind of hit it on blast impulse and sustained impulse through the intensity stuff. Like, you know, one to two reps, three reps up to five mm-hmm. kind of hits that. I want to talk a little bit about using the squat to train like power 15 plus power endurance and even like classic endurance to a certain degree. Um, I think you were hinting at this with how you use accessory movements with like these large rep ranges of like 30 reps. Like if you're moving, doing 30 reps, it's going to take you a minute. Yeah. And that's saying like you're not like all right, I need a little break at the top. Well, using using the single leg squat, like one thing I've been doing is is when I do those heavier sets, I'll get our our technique stick, like the GS technique stick. Mm-hmm. Dude, I'll get set, I'll go my left leg after I ramp up, and I'm doing like heavy doubles, like to basically my max. And then I'll rack it, I'll rest a minute and a half, and I like to look at my heart rate once it gets down under like 115. I'll have the technique stick. I'll go 30 on my left leg, 30 on my right leg, 30 on my left leg, 30 on my right leg while I'm holding that. And it, dude, I just get destroyed. And it's like, that's a way that I feel will transfer well to power 15 plus or to classical endurance even. And that's where I, I was going to tell you the the deadlift that I've been playing around with. I was calling it in my mind. I can call it the, the distance runner deadlift. I have semi bent knees and my heels are slightly elevated. Like a hack squat almost. S- sort of, but the bar's in front of me. Okay. And I'm pulling, and my heels are elevated, so I'm on, like, the end of a platform. I took a video of this, like, two weeks ago. I should just pull it up and show you. But I have, like, a bent knee, and I'm just pulling to, from mid-shin to, like, above the knee. And I'm holding my so ankle it has stable. Like a, it has, like, an RDL feel to it? Sort then? of, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. Like a floating RDL. Yeah, it's like a floating. Yeah, exactly like that. But a little bit more knee flexion than a, than a classic RDL. But because I'm holding that that ankle position, yeah, I felt that also in my quads quite a bit. Right, it, it reminded me of when I was hitting those high rep single leg squats. So it's like regarding like the the class the that durational strength characteristic. I think it's it's like how can you train that specific to blast impulse? That's, it's it's actually seems to be a little bit easier to do that, but then coming on the back end with accessories that are specific in that higher rep range. After you've already recruited the high threshold motor units, now your body can can get adapted to that uh, that more that higher level of volume over a long period of time. Yes. And I think I think that's what the way that? to do it. Those are the type one fibers, then yeah. two versus the type two fibers, or yeah. type two X or whatever. Right, the right. Neat things are they call it? Yeah. All right. Very nice. Very nice. I like that stuff. All right. Let's talk about overrated, underrated movements now. Oh. Jeez, okay. Overrated, underrated movements. You ready for this? Overrated, underrated. I was just waiting. Where, where's your weird freaking hand thing? <laughs> no one can see that. They're listening. Just yeah, a they few. Get... ASMR. This is a, you know, I watched a, a, what was that show that used to be on Discovery where it would be like Myth, no Mythbusters? And they oh. said that if you, rub, if you rub your hands together for seven seconds, that the amount of friction, it, it can the friction can clean your hands as well as antibacterial soap. Was it a myth or was it a fact? No, they, it was true. Oh, good. Yeah. So I don't ever use soap anymore. I just I just pee all over my hands. And does I just does do that get rid of the, all the yeah. fecal matter too? <laughs> <laughs> From the astigrat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's not there with the new with the new squatty potty. Yeah, that's <laughs> All right. Single leg squat, overrated, underrated. Underrated. It's not even rated. Like people are still this is just so mind blowing to me. Like I people still use like these rollers that are like this thin and then they'll be like, Well, I don't really like single leg squats. Dude, you choose you 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 used a roller that's this thin 
it couldn't support heavy load. You know, you're single leg squatting 135 pounds for, you know, three weeks. And then you say you don't like it. It's like, dude, Haley can single leg squat 200 plus pounds now for reps. And it leads to better pulls. So, and Haley's 49 kilos. And the reason why I'm using her as an example is like, if we're, if we're talking about training elite level athletes, like everybody should be doing this movement all of the freaking time. And I think it, the, like, it's, it's just amazing. It's, um, it's impressive to watch the open skilled athletes, single leg squat. Cause the numbers they do put most people's like just back squats, back squats to shame to shame. Yeah. And we're, I'm referencing elite athletes too yeah. when you see them do it. Yeah. And it carries over then to, then they're pulling a sled better then they're cutting better. They are, they're faster. They, they can keep their acceleration when they're getting hit. That's another big factor. Yeah. No, it's impressive. All right. Overrated, underrated. Hold on. I got to get rid of all the germs. Seven seconds. Front squat. Ooh. Uh, I would actually argue the front squat is underrated. Wow. And I, I think another factor is that people just don't want a front squat, so they don't do it. And even like the influencers can't who. can't get into a front rack. Yeah, they can't get a front. <laughs> even if I can't get into a front rack, I'll still do my old classic bodybuilder cross arm. Influencers who don't actually coach anybody will even talk about how like. They're doing back squats. They're doing walking lunges, but they don't want to do front squats because they're freaking hard. And that's the other, the other issues here. No one wants like the hardest thing for a, a kid. Okay. We had, we have this kid comes in and he's good. He, parents or his grandparents drive him from York. So he's coming like an hour, three to four days a week. Oh, wow. And he's a good athlete. He's 12. And DJ has been working with him a lot. Just back squatted 45 kilos for five. And we're talking about him, and and DJ's like, dude, the hardest thing for a young kid like this kid, he's 11, 12 years old, and I see it with Lincoln too, is it's hard to put weight on your back and oh, yeah. squat it. Like, you're like, uh, you know, everybody it wants hurts. to put the pad. Yeah, you're like, oh, my God, this is so uncomfortable. Now put that on your throat, and it makes <laughs> yeah. it even worse. And it's like you, you, you do that, and now nobody wants to do it because it's it just crushes your ego. And then you have issues like, like Sam at one point had, he was zombie squatting like 200 and he started to like black out. So it's like, I'm not saying that we want people to black out, but one thing is, is like what Sam's best front squats, like 235 or 240, you see a big drop off and it's, it's a freaking brutal work. It's a brutal exercise. So a lot of people avoid it. And then they don't, then as a coach, you, you hear people complain about it. You're like, Oh, well, we don't really have to use it, but it's, it's phenomenal. No. I actually think I'm better at a zombie than a front squat sometimes. Some people do get like that. I can't do like as that. much, but I think I'm better at it. Yeah, you feel um, better doing it. All right, this one's a weird one. You ready for yeah, it? Yeah, I'm ready. Overrated, underrated. Hack squat. Oh. That's weird. Is we just filmed like a version of the hack squat this morning. Yeah. Does that? Did you just come up with that, or was that? No, I had it in here. Really? Yeah. You know, I'm going to say underrated because I hate it. I hate doing it's it. It's awful, right? It's horrific. And it's like... It crushes your it, quads. I want to say we might have a YouTube video from like a year ago. And, and I even noted on that video, like, I hate doing it. Like, I hate getting it. And, and what's crazy is like, after like 10 reps, it does. it's not even a lot of reps. My legs, I just feel dead. Well, good. You used to give it for like sets of 17. Yeah, well... You wanted big quads. Yeah, I still don't have big quads. They're definitely bigger, <laughs> but like it was oh man. No, I, I think it's I think that's another one. It's like it's a you know, you, you see in the bodybuilding world very rarely John Meadows used to hit it quite a bit, but it's like most of the bodybuilders when they're targeting quads, they're just leg pressing, leg extension, because they're also great quad developer exercises. Yeah. But the hack squat, dude, it's a slayer. And to me, it's the machine slayer version of of freaking front oh, squats. Man. We should do a list of machine slayers. <laughs> yeah. And just have, call them all the John Connors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would be We were just talking about Terminator today. Man, listen to this. Dude, we were Terminator 2 as a sci-fi movie is unreal Take out how the good T1000 it is. and the Yo, T800. That movie is so good. How 3000? <laughs> yeah. What other AIs can we take out? There has to be all more. Yeah. Mother from whatever, I don't know. I can't think any right now. Oh yeah, Hal. that was how. No, was no, it? I know who you're talking. What's his oh, name? Is it is it Michael? Oh yeah, that's two thousand. No, it's not yeah. Michael. Which one? 
Oh, I forget it. My bad. Someone. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm not. Oh, yeah. Hack squad. All right. We have them? been doing either or with the pop culture. Oh, okay. But, but we're going to do an overrated, underrated here. Okay. So we got one more. Pop one culture. More. This is pop culture. Predator 2. I, dude, I might have only ever seen that twice. I was going to say that it has to be overrated. Oh, my goodness. Because Predator, I always thought, was underrated. I always liked Predator. I like Predator, too. Did you see Prey? No. The newest Predator one? No. You should see it. I'm not going to spoil it. I've you. always loved Predator. And I. it's funny is because I, I always think those movies are hokey, like Rambo. Um, but I still enjoy them for what yeah. they are. Well, the first Predator movie is purposefully hokey in the beginning. So, so but Predator Two, I dude, I I don't even know if I could remember that. No, Danny Glover, no. No, oh, well, damn, Danny Glover was in Predator Two. Yeah, really, man. Danny, you know his son was the lead singer for In Living Color. I did not know that. Yeah, Had no or idea. Living Color, Living Color, In Living Color was the uh, the Fox. cult of personality. Yeah, yeah, Living. Uh, in Living Color was the Fox version of Saturday Night Live yeah. back in like the 90s. I remember that. Homie don't play that. Yeah, yeah. The Wayans brothers were all yeah. over it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was in that. All right, let's go back to talking about the squat program and variations. You, you able to keep doing about this? We're still going on with the squat? <laughs> or are you done? You're, you, What's left? Um, I was just going to talk about the phases, but you got into that a little bit too. Um. Let's get into this, like, n a newer concept we've been talking about. I don't think it's new, but we've been thinking about it. Um, we mentioned it before, and we'll talk about it through, like, exposure comprehension if you want. But it's more has to do with in-season. Yeah. And sports where you don't have, like, a single event. So with a single event, you end up having, I guess it's, like, super compensation in the way you want to train for it. And, and as we discussed it was how do you keep sort of – you can't be super compensated all the time, but you can be close to it. Yeah. And we talked about it as like a rolling compensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within in-season training. So let's talk about using the squat to kind of get towards that rolling compensation for like a football player. So that would be where, you know, going back to our overrated, underrated, yeah. I would use something like the front squat. I would. So what I would do is I identify, okay, what movement can I push the load pretty well let's say we build up our let's say we look at our strength of schedule and we're uh you know six months out and we say all right these weeks we should be able to win these games pretty well let's build our back squat in the off season as heavy as it can get like get it big let's just say theoretical numbers everybody on the team can back squat 405 so everybody on the on the team back squats 405 or within reason right the way to, to do this rolling compensation is then what you do is on, on the weeks where you have like a lower strength of schedule is you push something like the front squat, which people can do frequently. And I know I've talked about this where I front squatted every day for two years yeah, straight. It should be a meme by now. But. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Zach Tellender talked about it in one of his videos about me saying that. Did he turn you into a meme? I probably. Uh, yeah. But what what you can then do is push your front squat on those weeks really, really hard. And then you might do a drop set with the unbroken back squat at like 50 or 60%. But the load and the intensity of the front squat raises your body's awareness and then it's heightened. So that then when you go do the back squat, you're actually holding closer to that higher level. And so you've just got to be creative, but it, it comes back to planning like six months out and saying, all right, if I'm going to plan this, if we, if we're going to do this as a strength coach, this is what I would do. And even for like, I'm thinking about Penn State. You know, if Penn State's playing Idaho or they're playing, you know, no knock on the Vandals out there uh, or anyone else, you know, let's say they're playing Indiana. You know, they should go in and really lay, lay it down on someone like Indiana, even though they lost during COVID to Indiana. Now, you should go in and say, all right, Sunday after a tough game and Indiana's the next week, I'm pushing our heavy front squats. So that's how I think that you can, you okay. can play that game to keep it closer with so squat. I what I heard is take a variation and push it real hard. Yeah. And a variation that will allow for the most intensity maybe, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the same intensity. Yeah. So like a back squat, front squat what? 90% of 85, it. 85, yeah. yeah. 80 to 90 somewhere to there. It. Yeah. But you just load it different right. if you will. All right. Very cool, very cool. 
Um, I did have something else, but I think we're going to get into the Discord and uh, YouTube community questions we have from the audience here. Ask away. Yeah. Make sure you join the Discord subreddit. Like, subscribe, click that notification bell, whatever. And Five also, plus stars. pay attention to our Garage Strength long form videos on the Garage Strength channel, and you can be part of our t shirt giveaways. And I know this is not that channel, but pay attention. Yeah, whatever. We're all part of the same umbrella community. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, Keist. Keist Kanegard. Yeah, good. I'm glad you said it. Now he can make fun of you. No, I don't know. <laughs> he, he, told, he on the Discord, he's like, "You pronounced that wrong, huh?" Uh, I'm not <laughs> like, you heard me say that's my forte. Yeah, <laughs> Earl's like, "That's my forte." Yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> Are there any wearables or other gadgets you guys feel is worth investing in to optimize athletic performance? No, I mean, I'd argue like I do like my Apple Watch. I have the new Apple Watch. I think it it does a good job monitoring my heart rate and it does a good job. Monitoring my runs and even intensity levels when I'm uh, lifting weights. But I don't think that, I mean, outside of that, I don't think, you know, I know the Garmin, I have friends that use Garmin's too, but I, for just strength stuff, dude, it's, I'm still like, a, I'm not bullish on, on many wearables. I, I think if you're speed focused, there's some GPS tracker trackers that are good. You like that stuff. Yeah. I think that stuff's reasonable. All right. But also with that being said, I, I don't think there's there's anything that you're missing outside of the data. Like there's specific data that you can get from the GPS trackers that you couldn't get from like videoing yourself. But if you're watching your strides in a video, you could pick up on some of that stuff without the, the GPS tracker. So watching things on video, I got rid of cable over a decade ago. So I'd like stop watching sports, if you will. Mm hmm. One of the things I notice when I end up like catching a sports game, if I'm like at a friend's house or something, or I'm just like out, or I'm with people who like, you know, they sit and watch sports at a party type of thing, like basketball, Super Bowl, yeah, basketball something like that. Right now, before I think I got numb to how fast they were, and from being removed from it for so long, I feel I actually see how fast it is more now. Yeah, yeah, like you is, appreciate it a bit more. Yeah, yeah, which I kind of found odd. It could also be like you just recognize it because you're slightly yeah. into it more no i was into it when i was watching <laughs> yeah, it too. i was yeah. all about it all right youtube community um rhino top deck rhino 3726 rhino top deck rhino 3726 let's yeah. go dane do you suggest doing the same progressive overload idea with add five pounds each set with cleans technical coordination movements and then there's more for example if I have three doubles starting at 135 pounds, should I complete the first set of doubles, go to 145, second set, then 155? Or should I do all three at 135, then three doubles more at 145, and so on? That sounds like a lot, uh, lots of extra volume, in my opinion. No, you would do like a double at 135, and then a double at 145, then a double at 155. He would ramp. Yeah. Now, or they would ramp. Yeah. Th then it could be like if they're in comprehension phase, I might say like, all right, this week we're doing four doubles or four triples at 155, and next week you're going to try and hit 165. Yeah, static. Or, yeah. yeah. So I think that that's, you know, to answer that clearly, I, I, I think you ramp, for the most part, ramping is – perfectly fine and you would go set by set by set building up on technical coordination movements yeah or just go like 70 kilos 110 kilos yeah 70 90 <laughs> 100 110 120 yeah and just be like all right maybe five kilo jumps now or yeah something. i mean see where you end up yeah anything else no that's it so head over to garage .com, pick up your single leg roller or go to peak app the google play store the apple ios store you're gonna get five free days of training with the peak strength app so that you can attain or start that journey to attain peak strength because remember freaks if you want to be a champion you've always got to cultivate your power until next time peace Bye.